give you an idea, the original fleet before World War II only had 300 air liners in it. By 1956, it had grown to 1,700 air liners, plus 23,000 military airplanes and 60,000 general aviation airplanes, all trying to operate in the same airspace. Now, when we're at a place like the Grand Canyon and get the look out over our vistas here, it looks like the sky is a huge place. But when you start putting a lot of airplanes, it gets crowded. And in the early days after World War II, we see a lot of problems in developing our air transport system. The air traffic control system had a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties in getting ready to deal with all of this traffic, all of this congestion. And unfortunately, the industry tended to grow a lot faster than the ability to control it. So that by 1956, we had a lot of airplanes flying in airspace that was completely uncontrolled. Some of the early technologies, the old radar systems, the old vortex systems, those are all being developed, but they're not really fully in place. Back in 1956, we didn't have transcontinental radar coverage. As a matter of fact, the only radar coverage we had was near big cities, near big terminal areas. And as soon as an airplane got away from one of those terminal areas, what do you think air traffic controllers are relying totally on for position reporting on that airplane? Position reports on the airplane. The crew knew where they were, and they told ATC. Some of the other things that we're developing and causing some controversy. If you're a pilot, you know what VORDME is. We have a lot of luxury today, even though that system's frankly getting kind of outdated. But back in 1956, the civilian folks wanted VORDME, the military folks wanted TACAN. And there was a gulf between the two technologies that nobody was willing to compromise on. And the net result was less than half of all the facilities that were supposed to be in place weren't there, hadn't been funded. Then we had a series of mid-air collisions which probably should have foreshadowed what was going to happen 50 years ago today. But all of these involved airliners and small airplanes, or airliners and military airplanes. And frankly, most of these, the airliner came out fine. The small airplane folks didn't do so well. But the airline got back to base, got the people home. Hollywood got involved. Some of you remember these movies. High and Mighty. Excellent movie, a little dated, excellent view into a world which isn't really there anymore, unfortunately. But Hollywood's involved. And as we press forward a little further, we get up into the 1955-1956 era. These are copies of TWA and United route system maps in 1955. We can see the transcontinental routes, we can see how things have developed. And as we start getting up toward the canyon, a couple of other things are going to cause some concern. President Eisenhower had appointed the Harding Commission to study and determine the development for the next 10 or 20 years of civil aviation. And once they concluded all of their analysis and submitted it in December 1955, they realized we got some serious problems right now that we need to fix right now. And then a little bit further, some of you may remember Najib Halabi. At the time, he was the Associate Administrator of the Civil Aeronautics Administration. Later on, he was going to become President of Pan Am and part of the FAA. But back then, he made a profound statement five days before the collision. Take a look at the last line of that statement and realize what he's actually trying to tell Congress. We also have jets coming. Jets do one thing very different than propeller-driven airplanes. They go fast. And once we start throwing all these new jet aircraft into the system, we're going to have chaos unless we do something right now. And the message really isn't getting through. This is the guy I mentioned earlier, Jerry Letter. He literally is the father of aviation safety. He was born in 1900, knew the Wright brothers. He helped pre-flight Lindbergh's airplane. In the 1940s, he was the first director of the Civil Aeronautics Board. By 1956, he's the director of the Flight Safety Foundation. And in February 1956, he predicts the collision. No greater evil. That's the title of the presentation. We've got warning. And very, very few people who can actually make a difference are listening. Then 29th of 
mentioned yesterday, 50 years ago. Part of the reason why Congress really was not paying much attention to aviation is Eisenhower's grand plan for a network of coast-to-coast -coast highways that we could move defense material and manpower anywhere we needed to very rapidly was enacted. The Federal Highway Act, otherwise known as the Interstate Highway Act, 50 years ago yesterday. The other thing that was going on that was pretty important and going to cause a lot of concern with the media was we were about to have 650,000 steel workers strike at midnight on the 29th of June. As a matter of fact, they did strike. Initially, those were the headlines on the 30th of June. And then we get up to this state. And at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dan. And he's going to tell you about the collision itself. Basically meant his last flight was the day before this flight. 